Here we go. March Madness. <laughs> I'm waiting on the music. <laughs> okay, we're back for a little more March Madness, ladies. Hopefully everybody is ready to play the Family Feud again. Round two. Let's take a look at where we came from last week with our bracket. Okay. Our bracket, we had, oh, we don't have our winners listed on there yet, um, but it was the Shepherd family that went on from this side, and the Bigler family went on from that side, and the winner was the Shepherd family. So, woohoo! Now the Shepherd family goes on to the final dance, the final four, which will happen on Share Day on March 10th. And, um, Speaking of bracket busters, your bracket may be busted if you thought one of these other core groups was going far, but we had a really fierce round of Family Feud yesterday at the Foundry, and I think we've got some pictures of their game over there. There we go. I think y'all can tell which family was the winner, the Fry family. So the Fry family is also going along to um, the big dance on Share Day. So we've got another round today and then one more round next week, and that will give us our four, our final four. So let's start the family feud on your mark. Let's start the family feud. First of all, hailing from one of our downstairs luxury suites, we have the Gailey family and their adorable leader, Amber. Come on up. And from the second floor west side, we have the Verona family. And they're, oh, look at them go, woo! <laughs> and from another lower level corner suite, the Williams family and their amazing leader, Laura. Come on up, ladies. And finally, rounding out round one, we have from the very farthest point on the second floor, the Brinkman family and their adorable leader, Angela. Angelique, all right, come on up, everybody. Okay, y'all are doing very good. Remember, the buzzers need to be seen by the audience. Can you, can y'all go around the back just so the buzzers can be seen? Sorry, you can scooch up. Okay. Everybody need, have a button pusher, put your hands on the table. There you go. And do y'all remember the rules, okay, or the, the gist of it? We've surveyed 100, and remember, these are really random people that we've surveyed. And so your, your job is to try to um, guess the most popular answer, and whoever hits the buzzer first gets to go first, and then you'll go in order of who hit the buzzer after that, okay? And remember our lovely buzzer judges here, and let's see, any, any other... Everybody clear on the rules? Okay. I will read the question slowly. Name something that people spread. Butter. Butter. It's on the board, ladies. Let's look at our next group. We're going to go with germs. Germs. It's on the board. <laughs> Good job, good job. Peanut butter. Can we say that? Peanut butter. Woohoo! It's on the board. <laughs> Rumors. <laughs> good job. It's on the board. You ladies are incredible, man. All right. Survey says. Okay, so the Verona family is win. We've got butter for 33, rumors and lies, 26 points, germs was 22, peanut butter was 10, jam and jelly, nine. All of y'all, great answers. Way to go, ladies. Woo! -hoo! If y'all can have a seat, maybe go on the outside to get back to your lead. Um, and t yes, go ahead. Y'all can have a seat. Y'all be back up in a minute. That was fun, fun and fast. All right, now we've got round two, let's see. For, for round two, let's welcome again from one of our lower level luxury suites, the Schmidt family and their adorable leader, Christy, come on up. From their penthouse place on the third floor, we've got the Luker family and their feisty leader, Gina, woohoo, come on up. 
Also, from their new home on the third floor, we have the Burton family and their adorable leader, Kim. Come on up, ladies. Woo! Love the red. <laughs> Yay! And finally, rounding out round two, we have also from the high rent district on the third floor, Ann Liner, the Liner family, and their group, their leader, Ann. Okay, everybody's around the table. Somebody's ready. Put your hands on the table, not all, hovering over the button. There we go, there we go. Everybody good on the rules? Okay, hands on the table. I'm going to read the question slowly. Name something you do every day of your life. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. It's on the board, ladies. Good job. Bathe. Bathe. <laughs> shower, bathe. Comb your hair. It's on the board. Comb your hair. Comb your hair. <laughs> Eat. Eat. It's on the board, ladies. Okay, let's take a look and see. Survey says, eat is the number one answer with 38 points. Brush your teeth, 35. Take a shower, we'll give that to the bathe people. And use the bathroom, that's pretty important. And sleep. Apparently everyone has messy hair, I don't know. Um, good job, good job, Luker family. Okay, you, you ladies go have a seat. Y'all can stay up here. And let's invite the Brana family back up. Can y'all scoot over here, Luker family? Luker family, y'all wanna scoot over to the middle? Okay, guys. Y'all remember, this is the bonus round. If you'll remember from last week, on the bonus round, we have surveyed, we have surveyed special groups of people for this. Remember that, ladies, we have surveyed the children's teachers, and those crazy ladies from the foundry that you saw in the picture before. So they have given the answers, and your job is to uh, guess the most popular answer, okay? Are you all ready? All right. Name a disciple. Hands on the, hands on the table. <laughs> Name a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter. It's on the board. John. Pardon? John. John. <laughs> Great job, ladies. Great answers. Let's see. Survey says Peter, number one with 19. Way to go, Verona family. And the Luker family was next with John. Take note, guys. Leslie Fry got one vote. Woo! -hoo! Lori Witt got one vote. And I love me. We're all disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Two people said that. I love that answer. Okay, great job. Y'all all did a fantastic job, Verona family. Woo! -hoo! High fives all around. Woo! They get to take some wonderful buntinis back to their core group this morning. Thank you all for being good sports and having fun with us this morning. Uh, one announcement, Kim Burton, your group, y'all have moved, you're still in your new place now, 310 into the hall. And if you are new this morning, come on up and we'll do a quick orientation. Otherwise, you ladies are dismissed. And don't forget to tune in next week for episode three, The Family Feud. Good morning. Um, our children have a great lesson. It's the lesson we learned before spring break. What we will be celebrating this coming Sunday, our children are learning the story of the triumphal entry that Jesus made into Jerusalem. They are getting ready in the next few minutes to have a triumphal entry out in the courtyard out there back by the baptismal. They're gonna ha they all have palm branches and they're gonna not take their shirts off, but the teachers have brought shirts. They'll throw down on the ground and uh, Jesus will actually ride a donkey 
a little stick donkey, um, through the middle of them as they sing hallelujah, hosanna to the highest, praises to the Lord. So it's a great lesson. Well, welcome back. I hope you are um, refreshed after spring break, and I hope you are ready to finish strong this amazing study of the gospel of Matthew. Um, we've got a lot to go over this morning, so I'm going to try and talk really, really fast. I hope I don't get tongue-tied. So anyway, so some of you may be aware that my son is getting married uh, soon. He's engaged to be married, and several months ago, his sweet fiance sent out some save the dates, and a save the date is really just an invitation to the invitation, right? And so now that we're six weeks away from the wedding, the formal invitations have gone out. I think we have a picture of that. The formal invitations, and I cannot believe my baby boy's name is on a wedding invitation. That is just amazing. That is beyond me. But it, with, inside the formal invitation was a response card. And the bride's family and us as the groom's family, we would love for all of our invited guests to come to the wedding. We want positive responses from all of them. But we know reality is there will be some who will decline the invitation, some who will ignore the invitation, but you know, there won't be consequences if you don't come to the wedding, right? But except you'll miss the most awesomest wedding ever, right? But, but you know, I'm just a little biased. But there's not consequences if you don't come to my son's wedding. What we see in scripture today tells us that there is a wedding feast, that if we decline the invitation, there are consequences, or as we will see, there are woes, right? So we're going to start out this morning talking about weddings, and we're going to finish talking about woes. So I've entitled this morning's lesson, Wedding Woes, which is never, you know, if you're the mother of a bride, you're right there with wedding woes, right? But um, what we're going to see this morning is that if we decline the invitation to come into salvation, there are very real and very eternal consequences to that decision. Jesus has invited all of us to come. Will you accept his invitation? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much that you give us these very clear scriptures this morning. You want us to come into fellowship with you with you. You desire for us to do that. And if there is one woman here this morning, Father, that has not made that decision, I pray that today is the day that she hears you clearly and she makes that decision to follow you in obedience. And Father, for the rest of us who have accepted that invitation, I pray that we will see these scriptures today as the impetus to push us to extend that invitation to everyone we know, to make sure that they understand that the invitation applies to them also. Father, we thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we begin, I just want us to all kind of get our bearings where we are since we've taken a week off and we've uh, traveled and slept and all that kind of good stuff. So the, everything that you read that you talked about today, these entire two chapters, all of that discussion, all of that teaching happens in one day. Okay, remember before spring break, we did the Palm Sunday. We, Jesus entered on Sunday into Jerusalem. On Monday, he went to the temple and turned the tables over, y'all remember. And then on Tuesday, he started this big discussion. We talked about it a little bit before the holidays, those two um, parables. And then he's going to pick up where he left off. So there's, that chapter break is a little awkward because it's really just the same discussion. So these two chapters all happen on the Tuesday of Passion Week. So I've divided these two chapters, we're going to squish it all together, divided these two chapters into four segments. Wedding invitations, wearisome debate, weighty observations, and whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, so we'll start with wedding invitations. So this wedding parable, this is the third parable in a, the set of three. Remember chapter 21, he had those other two parables. At the end of chapter 21, the parable of the two sons and the parable of the tenants. And the, both of those parables talked about the hypocrisy and disobedience of, of those people. And it's just a, a picture of turning their back on Jesus, on, on the Christ. And so it, it's a picture of not entering the kingdom, right? And so this is um, the third parable. Jesus, and at the end of chapter 21, we saw it said that the 
all of a sudden the light bulb goes off in the Pharisees' mind and they go, hey, he's talking about us. He's calling us hypocrites. He's saying we're disobedient. And so Jesus doesn't let up. He puts the pedal to the metal and he gives them another parable. And that's the parable of the wedding feast that we see this morning. This is, so God is throwing a party for his son, right? The king is throwing a party for his son. And the guest list includes all of Israel, God's chosen people. Those, that's who's invited to this wedding. Now, the king has invited them to come to the table, but this invitation, it really is a little bit more of a command than a casual invitation, okay? Because when the king, think about royalty today. If the queen over in England invited you to come and dine at her table, think of the importance and the significance and the honor and the privilege involved in that. So that's the picture here. He has invited them to come and sit at his table and dine with him at his table. This invitation to the banquet is a picture of coming by faith into an understanding and a knowledge that the Messiah is the Savior, the King of the world. And so the King has sent out the invitation, the save the date, if you would. And what happens? No one comes. No one comes to the banquet. But God is so patient with his people and so loving. He sends out a second invitation. And it's as if he's saying, look, the dinner's hot. It's on the table. Come before it gets cold. I want you sitting at my table with me. But again, that invitation is met with apathy and aggression, right? This type of rejection was beyond just discourtesy. This was flagrant, blatant, intentional, rebellious disobedience to the king. So the king sends out a third messenger, right? Y'all saw that? Did you notice that in those first two parables that we looked at before the holidays, the head of the, those parables sent out third messengers in each of those two. But the third messenger in each of those was Jesus Christ. He sent out his son, right? And the son was killed. This time, he, the third messenger in the, the wedding parable is not the son. He sends out his army. This is a picture of judgment, the judgment or the woe that will come to anyone who refuses the invitation of salvation. And ladies, we need to understand, because we're going to look at some difficult passages this morning, but we need to understand that there are very real consequences associated with refusing the invitation to come to salvation. We need to know that refusing the invitation to come into fellowship with Jesus will have eternal consequences. And as deep as we like to see his love, we love to look at how deep his love goes, right? But just as deep as his love goes, his wrath goes equally as deep for anyone who will reject him. So, the feast is ready, the food is hot and on the table. Celebration is about to begin But Israel has said, no, we don't want to come. So the king says, I want you to go out and find anyone and everyone. You invite them all. And when he says all, he means all, all. And this is a a picture of what we're going to be studying next year. This is a plug. We start registration next week, ladies, for the study of Acts. So um, this is a picture of the church age because he's inviting all to come. And when all come, this is after the resurrection of Jesus. This is after Pentecost when the doors of the church are open to any and all who will come. It's a beautiful picture. And so there's an interesting footnote at the end of that wedding uh, parable, and it talks about the king um, walks into the banquet, and he noticed that, that there's one person that is not in wedding clothes, and we need to know a little bit about the culture to understand that. Um, like you and I, we get a wedding invitation, we go out and buy a new dress, right? That is not the case back in Jesus' day. The poor people had maybe one set of clothes. They wore the same thing every single day. And so um, when you would go to a wedding, the host would provide you with a garment to put on to, so that you wouldn't look real conspicuous in your old dirty clothes and so that it would be a festive, beautiful celebration, okay? So what has happened here is that this guest has gone in in his dirty clothes. 
Now the symbolism, what this is showing us, is that um, salvation, when we receive salvation from the Lord, when we come to him, he takes our filthy garments off of us. And he dresses us in our robes of salvation. And when you are dressed in the robe of salvation, it symbolizes that you are forgiven, your sins have been covered by the blood of Christ, and that you are a member of the body of Christ. So this man standing at the wedding feast in his filthy clothes, as opposed to the wedding clothes, symbolizes that he thinks he can get to heaven on his own, on his own righteousness. And the king says, no, that's not how it works. You have to be washed by the blood of Christ to enter into heaven. The nation's leaders were guilty of spiritual blindness, hypocrisy, and deliberate disobedience to the word. And you would think that they would yield to what Jesus is talking to them. They, they understand he's talking to them. You'd think they'd yield and repent, but instead they dig their heels in further and they engage him in arguments trying to trap him. And that brings us to our second point this morning, wearisome debate. We can all imagine that these Pharisees aren't too keen standing there. There's big crowds and Jesus has just called each one of them out as hypocrites, right? So they're not really thrilled with what Jesus is talking about. And so um, they decide that they're going to once again try and entrap or entangle him to say something that will cause them um, to be able to arrest him. But this questioning, this is so fascinating, this questioning, it, it, it's an it is examination, really. And it has a bigger purpose than just trying to entrap him. Remember, this is Passover week, right? And so there's pilgrims coming from all over to the Passover and they have to bring a sacrifice, right? If they didn't bring one from home, they'll buy one in the temple. But many of them brought a sacrifice from home. If you bring a lamb from home, for instance, you don't just get to go up to the altar and get to sacrifice it. It has to go through an inspection process. A priest will look over that lamb and make sure there's no blemish or no fault in that lamb. Because if there is a blemish or fault with the lamb, it will be rejected as an acceptable sacrifice sacrifice. Remember, this is Tuesday of Passover week, and on Friday, Jesus will give his life as the Passover lamb. So this questioning, this examination, is meant to find fault or blemish with Jesus, because that would render him an unacceptable sacrifice, right? But as we know, they could find no fault. Peter tells us, We were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. The first question comes in this examination, and it comes from the Pharisees and the Herodians. You uh, looked at this in core group. These are two factions that hate each other, really, on different ends of the political spectrum, but they've come together with one common enemy, and that is Jesus. And so I hope you notice the sappy, sweet way they're talking to him. Did you see that? They, oh, Jesus, you speak truth all the time. It's so wonderful what you say. All the while they're plotting his murder. And so this is what Jesus is trying to make sure that the people understand. These guys are hypocrites. Don't believe what they're saying, right? So the first question of this examination, trying to find fault with Jesus, is that they say, well, should we pay t- taxes? You talked about this a little bit in your core group. The answer is yes, of course, give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to the Lord what is the Lord's. And that brings up a question, what is God's? Everything, everything. So we need to give him everything, all of who we are. We need to give him all the glory of everything that we do in our lives. So he answers that question pretty easy. Check, check. Next, next up to the bat, the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees must be thinking, we got this easy. Those Pharisees messed up. We'll trap him. We'll get him on this next question. And the Sadducees come up, and they start talking to him. And they're an interesting lot because the the big thing here is they do not believe in the resurrection, okay? And so Jesus, so they come up with this crazy hypothetical situation, right? So this woman's married to this man. The man dies. She marries the brother-in-law. He dies, marries the brother-in-law. He dies. I don't know what she's doing to kill off all these husbands. But anyway, so the, the Sadducees' logic is 
There can't be one wife and seven husbands in heaven. That doesn't make any sense. So therefore, there is no resurrection. Jesus, what do you say? Well, Jesus responds, you have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) You're absolutely, totally wrong. And he explains that there's not going to be marriage in heaven. Now, for those of you who are in a wonderful marriage, this might upset you. What do you mean I'm not going to be married? I'm not going to spend eternity married to my spouse in heaven. Well, we just need to trust that God has better things planned for us. And we need to understand also that there is a wedding in heaven. And it's talked about in Revelation 19. And it's the wedding of the Lamb. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, marries the bride, the church, which is all of us. That is the wedding that takes place in the marriage in heaven, okay? But Jesus doesn't finish, he's not finished with them. He starts speaking the language that the Sadducees would understand. Because the Sadducees, uh, Moses is the, the highest authority the, that it, they, it comes. You know, he's the ultimate in authority. So Jesus references the story of the burning bush with Moses. And he says, look, Moses recognized uh, resurrection, so I don't know why you are not following who, what Moses is teaching, okay? And that was when it brought us all back to I am the, the father of, um, I am the God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say I was their father. He says I am. Currently, they are alive, okay, in resurrection, Okay, so he took care of the Sadducees. Next, and the Pharisees come back. And this time, they bring their lawyer with them, right? And so the lawyer's there, and he says, which is the greatest of the commandments? And this is interesting because Pharisees, um, they didn't have just ten commandments. They had, um, they spent an inordinate amount of time and energy focusing on the commandments. They had over 600 commandments that they had come up with. Some were more important than the others. Some were weightier than the others. Some had more of a penalty than the others. And so they say, Jesus, which one is the greatest of all of these commandments? And Jesus simply quoted to them the Shema. Now the Shema, this is just, this is how this just all weaves together. It's amazing. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4, which is what Jesus is quoting in our Matthew scripture, which is our memory verse, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Now the Shema is something that an Orthodox Jew would have said, still to this day, says twice a day, every day, morning and evening. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind and all your soul. Okay, so Jesus is Uh, that's the greatest command. You should know that, right? You say it twice a day, but here's, this is pointing out the hypocrisy. They don't even follow what they say. They say it, but they aren't living it, okay? And so with that, the examination was complete, and Jesus was found to be without blemish. Jesus, having silenced his critics, the Sadducees, the Pharisees are still there. He's standing at the temple, There's lots of people around, but he turns his attention from those religious leaders, and he wants to speak directly to the people now and his disciples. And so he's speaking directly to the crowd and his disciples. And that brings us to our third section, some weighty observations. Jesus is going to say what he sees in these religious leaders. He continues to point out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders and the hypocritical behavior, and we all Um, have hypocritical behavior in our lives. I know I do, um, but hopefully you, like I, recognize it when we do it and we repent of that and, and do our best to turn away from that. But this hypocrisy is a habitual, repetitive, continual, and unapologetic behavior, okay? So that's what we're looking at. This is a little bit different. Well, I, I, anyway, okay. So the Pharisees have convinced themselves that to get to heaven, you need to be great. And the way that you are great is by how 
righteous you look, how pious you look, how many titles you have, how many times you go to church, how many good deeds you do. And so that's how you get to be great. That's how you get to heaven. There was no heart attitude behind this. There was no mercy, no justice, none of that. They were true hypocrites in every sense of the word. So Jesus' indictment begins by observing that the Pharisees have seated themselves in Moses' seat. Now, it's interesting. Nowhere in Scripture are we told that God gave Pharisees the authority to sit in Moses' seat. Well, they're sitting there. They're sitting in Moses' seat, and they've got lots of power, and they have lots of authority. And um, it's kind of, to me, it kind of reminded me, you know, Wizard of Oz, with the great and powerful Oz is behind the curtain, and he's talking a big talk, but you pull the curtain back, and he, he can't back it up. He, he doesn't walk the walk, right? That, that's the picture here. And then it, he says, you know, these Pharisees, he's telling the crowds, they love titles. They love, like, having all these initials behind their name, right? I remember one time I was at a dinner party, and th- it, this just stuck out in my mind. Um, as a friend introduced me to this gentleman. She said, Leslie, this is John Smith. And I, I stuck my hand out to shake his hand, and he very rudely kind of rolled his eyes at the lady that was introducing us and he sticks his hand out and he goes that's Dr. John Smith and I remember thinking really seriously it's that kind of attitude that Jesus is admonishing here with titles and things the Pharisees wanted people to know just how important they were and greatness in the Pharisees eyes were also in how was about receiving praise from other people. When their, the congregation, their flock would say, oh, look at them, they're so righteous. They are so, they're, they're such servants. Look, but they're not serving, they're just looking the part. And it talked about, and I wanna touch on this because I found this so interesting. It talked about that they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Did y'all wonder what that was about? Phylacteries, I think we have a picture of that. We have a picture of a phylactery. This is a, it's a small leather box that still to this day, Orthodox Jews wear, and there's also straps on their arms. And what would be in, on their arm or in this box, guess what? That Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, love the Lord your God with all your mind and all your heart and all your soul. That's all that's in there. And in Deuteronomy, the Lord instructed Israel, wear these instructions on your head and on your arms as a reminder of how you're to live your life. It started out as a great thing, right? So they wear this on their head, but it said that they have made the, the phylacteries broad. So they're like walking around with this big UPS box on their head, right? So that everybody will notice, look at me, I'm super spiritual, right? But the problem is the box is empty. Looks good on the outside, but the box is empty. And it also said they wore their fringes long. They had come to the understanding that the longer your tassel, the longer your fringes, I think we have a picture of that, um, the the more holy you were, right? And that that was kind of the picture there. So they're making their fringes long so that people will go, oh, wow, you were just super spiritual. And that's how they thought they were great. And so Jesus has made these observations. He's told the crowd, this is what your religious leaders are doing. And he says, because it's all hypocritical, it's all for show, there's going to be consequences. And that leads us to our fourth section of scripture, the woes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, we need to understand that when Jesus gives these woes, this is not, he's not losing his temper. This is not out of a burst of anger. This is righteous anger for the sin that they have committed and for the sin that they have caused the people to fall into. But his attitude is one of painful sorrow. This, this breaks his heart to issue these woes to his people. He wants more than anything that they would come to the table. He's invited them. He's been so patient with them, but they continually refuse to come to the table. And so he wants them and he wants us to know that there are consequences for refusing the invitation. So 
you looked in your study and in your core groups, you looked at several of these woes. I, I want to just touch on a few of them. And yesterday in our leaders council, I said, you know, it's easy for us to point a finger at someone, at, at these guys in the Bible and say, oh, those Pharisees, look how hypocritical they are. And my friend Robin said, you know, when we point one finger, there's three fingers pointing back at us, right? So that's, I want to look at a few of these and look back in the mirror a little bit instead of just pointing fingers at them. So uh, the first one is, it was the first woe, and it was these people, uh, Jesus says, you are not only are not coming to me, but you're standing in the way of other people coming to me. So the question would be, is there something in your life that is hindering or harboring or forbidding someone else from coming to the Lord? Is there um, some hip hypocrisy in your life maybe that some, your neighbor, your friend, looks at your life and goes, you know what, if that's what Christianity is, that's no different than me. Why should I go be a Christian? Why should I look into that? So is there something hypocritical in your life that needs to change so that you're not standing in someone else's way of coming to the Lord? Another one, um, it said about swearing on sacred objects. Um, this is just about being honest, really. Are you a person of your word. And th this is where we need to really uh, examine and look in a mirror. Are, are you trustworthy? Is your yes a yes and your no a no? Do people know they can count on you when you say something? You're honest and are you trustworthy? Or are you hypocritical in that area? Another one was um, being clean on the outside and filthy on the inside. And it talked about the cup, and then it also talked about um, the whitewashed tomb. I don't have time to describe that, but it, it's a beautiful uh, picture. The whitewashed tombs were all gleaming white, but on the inside was death and decay. It's just a graphic picture of hypocrisy. So do you look good to the outside watching world? You got it all together as they look at you going out your driveway? But on the inside, in your heart and in your mind, there's filth. We need to look in the mirror. So it's against that backdrop, that indictment, that we see Jesus is deeply grieved for his people. And he says in the very last, one of some of the very last verses, verse 37, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. You would not. It's interesting, that's the exact same illustration Moses used in his final farewell sermon. The hen gathering her brood. It's a picture of tender, loving care and a willingness to die for her children. I want to close with a little illustration I found. about a, There was a forest fire out west, and after the fire tamped down, um, firefighters were going through the, the burned areas uh, looking for hot spots. And one firefighter came across a black lump in the trail up ahead. And so he, as he got closer, he could tell that this was a ch the charred remains of a bird. And so he went up to it, and he was going to just kind of take his boot and kind of kick it out of the way. And as he kicked that carcass out of the way, he was shocked because out from under that carcass, that charred carcass, run four little chicks, and they scattered in every direction. That mama hen gathered her brood under her wing and gave her life so her babies could live. Jesus invites you and I to come and take shelter under the wing of the Most High God. He has given his life so that you and I may have ours. He invites us today to come, but he's not going to force us. He will not ever force you to come. But he invites you to come where you accept his invitation. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you that you have invited us all to the table. Let us be women who obediently come in reverence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.